Hello and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's first Wednesday speaker presentation, an event we host on the first Wednesday of every month. My name is Deborah Schwartz and I am director of this speaker series and our oral history program. Both programs are in collaboration with the Mill Valley Public Library. Tonight's presentation is titled The History of the Mill Valley Historical Society with Tim Amex. Also with us tonight is history librarian, Franklin Walder. He's in charge of the back end of things in this format, and we are very appreciative of his help. And of course, we also want to thank the Mill Valley Public Library for allowing us to host our speaker series in this safe and accessible format. Before we begin, I want to say to those of you in the audience who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, Thank you for your generosity and interest. Your membership allows us to continue our efforts to infuse history into the present through speaker presentations, oral interviews, history walks, history plaques, and the collaboration to restore and to return to Mill Valley engine number nine, the last remaining locomotive from the Mount Tamalpais Scenic Railroad. For those of you who are not yet members, please join us. Membership ensures that you will be alerted to future talks such as tonight's and our annual walk into history that takes place on Memorial Day weekend. You'll receive Chuck Oldenburg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes via email, and you will be updated about other historical events in our town and nearby. Membership to our organization is so affordable and just a click away on the Mill Valley Historical Society website. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar, but functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. If you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during this presentation. Now the Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentation, and I'll address those questions to Tim after his talk. But if you have comments or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. Tonight's talk will last about an hour, and after we'll take time for questions and comments from the audience. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Mill Valley Historical website in about three or four days. Just go to our website, click events, select First Wednesday Lecture Series, and you'll find tonight's recording as well as many others. Backyard blindness. It's a real thing. As a historical society, we strive to capture local and regional history. When Tim approached me about creating a talk about the Mill Valley Historical Society itself, I realized with a degree of embarrassment that his topic was long overdue. Tim Amex knows Mill Valley. He's a longtime Mill Valley resident and graduate of Tamil Pius High School, class of 1977. He's an event and videographer by trade and owner of Amex Video and Editing. A self-described local history junkie, Tim's passion for history also extends to greater California and the United States. So please, won't you give a warm welcome to Tim Amex. Tim? I'm here. <laughs> Yay. You, Amy. So I'm nice here. to have you. Thank you, Deborah. I'm doing my first actual Zoom presentation. I've been part of Zooms in terms of guests uh, of other people hosting, but this is the first time I've actually presented. So this is a new challenge for me as I can see myself coming in and out of my camera. And although <laughs> much of this talk will be actually a PowerPoint. So you'll probably just see me in the, in the corner. Well, I'm right here waiting to hear. I know in our practice sessions, I learned a lot about the Mill Valley Historical Society. And you'd think of all people, I'd know a little bit about something, but I mean, you can never get it all. And I know that many of the board members are really appreciative to be 
you know, kind of caught up with our history. And I hope the community will, will be as well. So thank you for the idea and thank you for tonight. Yes. Well, like me, you are a not only a history junkie in Mill Valley, but probably a history of the history of <laughs> the Mill Valley Historical Society. So I think you are the perfect audience for this. And we hope that whoever is tuning in will also enjoy this. Okay. Well, take it away, Tim. Okay. Before I cut away to the big screen, I wanted to give you a little bit of orientation. I always thought about this when I'm watching someone present. I'm always kind of curious as to where they are. So am I at the library? This doesn't look like the Mill Library. I, if we were doing an actual talk, I would have been at the library down in the, the room where they do the presentations. But I am in my home office in, not Mill Valley, Nevada, California. I was uh, I grew up in Mill Valley, lived there through my high school years, came back and lived there for as an adult, raised my kids there for 26 years. However, in 2018, I relocated to Novato, and this is where I am now in my Novato home office. So with that said, so you kind of have an idea where Tim's coming from, let's tune in to the share screen, and I'm going to cut to this, and you should see. So Deborah, confirm you see what you should be seeing. Which I is, see uh, almost a full page of the opening to your slide presentation. Perfect. Okay. Well, here we go. So as the screen says, it's the history of the historical society. And throughout the night, I'm going to, for better or worse, constantly be referring to me, us, we, because this is kind of what it's all about. It's my perspective or my living through the Middle Ages uh, for, for, for lack of a better word, the Middle Ages, and I'll touch on that in just a minute, of the history of the Mill Valley Historical Society, which has been around for 46 years. I'll be jumping around a timeline, which is going to start in 1951. I'll come to present, then I'll go back to 92. I'll jump into the 80s. So this won't necessarily be a by the books chronological of start to finish. It'll be jumping around, learning about events, traditions, that the Historical Society has had in its 46 years. Let's get started to the next page. This will be our agenda for tonight, so you got to have an idea of what we are going to cover. Uh, we're going to have, actually, number one, scratch that out. We're not going to have background in Mill Valley because I did a time test the other day, and we ran out of time for that. So if you want to know about Mill Valley background, you're going to have to take a history walk, and one of your guides will give you some wonderful information about the background in Mill Valley. We're going to start on number two, which will be talking about Lucretia, Hanson Little, then we will cover the history room, the founding, the history walks, first Wednesdays, talk about membership, the board of directors, we'll touch on the annual dinner meeting, we'll have a section talking about the review, which is the Mill Valley Historical Magazine, we'll touch on some special projects that the, I wanted to say club, we're not quite a club, the organization has sponsored and hosted over the years, and then before we call it a night, I have some shout outs and then we'll do a Q&A. It's my intent, Deborah and those in the crowd, to have my talk be no more than 50 minutes, maybe 55. So I have a little timer up in my in the corner of my screen. And if I get behind, I might kind of zip through rather quickly on the, the final third of the slides. So I do want to leave time for a Q&A and have everyone out of here at a decent hour. Street cred, as in the credentials of the presenter. So why am I the person who's going to talk to you about the historical society, the history of the historical society? Well, in reality, it could have been one of hundreds of people who were would have been even more qualified than myself. But no one had stepped up in the last 40 years to talk about it. And it occurred to me, me being a history junkie of Mill Valley and the going ons of the historical society, I've been such a part of it. For, well, I'll touch on that in just a minute, how long I've been a part of it. Let's go right to that slide. So when I talk about the presenter, this means me. I'm the presenter. So this is, gives you a little bit of perspective of where I've been in the timeline of the historical society. On the top line, it says MVHS, to save some time, was founded in 1977. And I, myself, the presenter, joined as a member in 1992. So a little math means that they were 15 years into their, their history as an organization when I joined as a member. I began leading walks in 1998. 
Below that, in 2001, after three years of coercion from some older board members, I was invited to join the board of directors and did join. Was a member for eight years before I bump, was bumped up to the vice president in 2009. And then again, usually people just kind of twist your arm to make you or to, to assign you the president, which I did take over in 2010. Did that for four years and resigned from the board of directors in 2015. <clears throat> And the bottom line says I'm still a present member and I still eat annual walks every May up until the current. So the very bottom line is the presenter has been involved with the Mill Valley Historical Society 31 of its 46 years. It makes me sound old. So let's begin with Lucretia Hanson Little. If you've ever been to the history room downstairs basement of the library, you probably know that it goes by the name of the Lucretia Hansen Little History Room. Well, now you're going to know who, who she is, who she was. She was not born in Mill Valley, but the family moved to Mill Valley when she was 11 years old. She grew up at 157 Level Avenue, a house that is still there. It's a house that actually we spoke about a number of years ago when we led a history walk. She attended Summit School, which has long since been torn down, and attended Tamil Pius High School, which is still there. After marrying, leaving the state, divorcing, moving back to Mill Valley, she got a job as the, his, not the historian, the city clerk in 1951 with Mill Valley. And although she, it was a number of years before she was actually called a historian, she almost immediately started collecting things that were at the office, photographs, maps, documents, uh, bills. I was, I wasn't told, but I read in some articles about Lucretia that she was a pack rat who saved every possible thing that was related to Mill Valley history, kept him in her house. She lived in a little house not far from, from uh, around the corner from the Outdoor Art Club. And there they stayed. They stayed there for many years. There was no history room. The library never really did anything that was historically related, although she kept all this stuff in her home. And so due to this wonderful collection, by 1969, the city council knew that she was saving things and she had started an oral history program with some friends. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. And she was named the town's official historian by Dean Mayer in 1969. And there she is in a, in a parade. In 1973, she retired. And she began to give more talks, more lectures, but yet there was still no history room, so to speak, in the Mavali Library. All of the, the goodies that she kept were still at her house until 1977. 1977, that was the year, was the year after the bicentennial in the United States. Perhaps you remember all the goings on in 1976. Well, Mill Valley acquired a grant for $17,000. They gave her to the library, and seven, those $17,000 were applied to building or actually redesigning a history room in the basement of the library. Uh, as it is now, if you go to see the history room now, that is not the history room that opened in 1977. The Mill Valley was remodeled in 1996. If any of you are around in 96, you remember it was closed down for a number of months as they remodeled and rebuilt. But what it was in 1977 was a, a storage room. A, a, it's probably about a third, I recall it pretty well, it was probably about a third of the size of what is currently the history room. A woman named Jean Hillcox, who worked for the library, at that time she was a retired, not she was not the head librarian, but a librarian. Jean Hillcox headed, headed up the group that bought the furniture, bought the shelves, and put all of the stuff together. And I'm going to touch on why she did that and why Lucretia did not do that. Here in 1977, June 1977, they opened the Lucretia Little, Lucretia Hanson Little History Room. Now, sometimes three names are used. Hanson is her birth name. Little is her married name. So it's kind of interchangeable. Sometimes it's Lucretia Little Room. Sometimes it's Lucretia Hanson. Other times it's all three, so it's all the same person, and that's where the, the difference of the names comes from. Six months after the opening of the historical history room, Lucretia Little passed away. So apparently she had been ill for a while and was 
unable to attend the actual opening of the room that was dedicated to her. And she passed away in June 1977, which coincided with the actual founding of the Historical Society. Now let's get right into what they started to do the year after they they uh, founded. Let's actually talk about the first board of directors. And the first row, a woman with a striped shirt, that is Helen Thompson Dreyfus. She was the first president of the Mill Valley Historical Society, which is appropriate for she was a longtime Mill Valley resident, grew up in a house called Treehaven which we actually walked around and toured. I want to say that was probably 1995, 1996. And two to the right of Helen on the front row in the chair, that's Thelma Percy. She was the head librarian at the time. The Mill Valley Historical Society mission, not so much a mission, mission statement, but each year, us walk guides read this from the from the walk book, uh, the primary goal there, meaning the historical society, their primary goal when they found it was to make all historical material related to Mill Valley, including the invaluable collection of books, pictures and documents collected by Mrs. Little. Other goals established were work for the library and all matters related to the history room. And I should point out even before I go to number two, the history room is not home of the historical society. The history room is a room of the Mill Valley Library. The historical society as it is, is an organization that is, for lack of a better word, we're, we're homeless. We reside our materials and background in the history room, but the history room is actually owned and run by the Mill Valley Library. And so it's by their good graces that the historical society has a home for all of their documents. And we always wanna point out a big thanks to the folks at the library, and I'll mention some names a little bit later as well. Number two, the MVHS took responsible for the popular First Wednesday programs, which apparently had begun even before the founding of the Historical Society, and they continued. Again, something that began before the founding was the oral history program, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So the big thing, I'm going to start with what I think is probably one of the, uh, there are so many wonderful things that uh, events that the Historical Society sponsors or backs, but the walk is a tradition that has been going on from day one, and it is wonderful. For me, this is what really brought me into the fold of, of the Historical Society from a casual member who attended occasionally the first Wednesdays to someone who became involved with one of their major activities which led to me becoming even more involved with the board of directors and an even bigger scope of activities. Their first walk was 1978, spring, Memorial Day weekend. And why did they choose Memorial Day weekend? Well, that was chosen because that was the date of the initial land auction in 1890, when Mill Valley started selling off lots for the first homes to be built. And since that day, I wanna say it's been every Memorial Day weekend, but I can't be 100% sure but I am 100% sure that many times the board of directors have had discussions about changing the date because there have been occasional dates where the numbers dip. And the first thing people say is, well, the date's no good. We can't do it on Memorial Day weekend. There's too much going on. People are out of town. There's the parade and there's the mountain play. And then it, yet we have a discussion. Well, how about the 4th of July? Well, people are out of town. How about Labor Day? No, there's no good people out of town. How about Thanksgiving? No, people out of town. How about Christmas? It's too cold. So we always kind of come back to Memorial Day is the day because it's as good or bad as any other day to host the walk. And it's the tradition because that's when the first lots were sold. The first walk in 1978, look how much it cost for Historical Society members, $1. And if you were not a paid up member, you had to pay $250. But look at the bottom. If you were under 16, which was probably nobody, or if you were over 65, which was probably the majority of people, 50 cents. So that was quite a bargain to take the first walk in 1978. And this is a look at the typed and mimeographed guidebook. We've come a long way since 1978 in terms of typing it and mimeographing and taking it down to tan prints and printing out dunk, 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 25 walks books and handing them out. Now the 
guidebook director just goes doo, 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 PDF sent off. Now print it yourself or read it off your phone. These are two of the stops that we had the first year, the Tamalpais Land and Water Company. And I hope I hope everyone who's watching this has at least taken one walk to kind of get an idea of what goes on in these walks and some of the landmarks that we touch on frequently. The Tamalpais Land and Water Company was the original group of bankers who owned, owned Mill Valley and sold off lots. And again, the first auction I touched on, well, what was it? It was the selling off of the lots in Mill Valley, and they did it at Old Mill Park, if I didn't mention that. Let's jump up to 1998. This is one year after Tim, I begin leading walks. And let me tell you my, my, my first little story about walks. The first walk I took was 19. Night. Let me go back even more. This is a kind of a fun little story. I first joined the Historical Society, as I pointed out, in 1992. And the following year, May 1993, would have been the first walk that I was going to take. And I was planning on it all year round. And they started promoting it. And I was excited about going to take the walk. And that year, they were beginning at the library. And so Memorial Day weekend came. I went down to the library, got there at 10 o'clock because they said, we're going to have walks between nine and three, get there anytime, and you can take a walk. I showed up to the library at 10 o'clock, not a soul in sight. Library was closed. Nobody was there. I thought, well, and I looked at my flyer. It said library, not the outdoor club. And then I looked at the fine print. Oh, Sunday, Memorial Day weekend, not Memorial Day of Memorial Day weekend. So little old naive me thought when it said Memorial Day weekend, it meant Memorial Day. So I showed up the day after the walk had taken place and hence missed out, quite disappointed, the first year I was going to take the walk. I had to wait a whole year till 1994. I actually finally got my first walk, which was just two months after my first daughter was born. I remember walking around, carrying her in one of those back things, walking up the stairs, carrying my, my two-month-old daughter and loved it. Had a great guide. The following year, 1995, had a terrible guide. The guy was reading out of the book the entire time. And the walk guide leaders always tell us, do not read from the book. Scan, learn certain parts, and you want to be able to improvise and talk. You can read sections, but you don't want to read the whole thing. This person read every stop. It was so boring. And at that moment, I said, I can do better than this guy. I'm going to lead a walk next year. And so the next year would have been 1996. Turns out I didn't have time to do all the training. Had to wait another year, 1997, led my first walk. And I've been doing them just about every year since 1997. This is what a typical walk book would look like. And I think if you've taken a walk, you know that your guide or one of the assistants with the guide will frequently hold up the signs. Okay, here's the map. And here's the photograph of this, of this location. And that year was the sunny side tract. And this is a look at my book, Tim's book. I would highlight the green, uh, meaning very important information that I did not want to miss. And anything that was not in green was information I tried to absorb and add whenever I had time. Jump up to 2001. This was one of the more popular walks. Anytime you talk about railroads, they're really popular walks. In 2001, they caddied us up, that's not the word, shuttled us up in one of those cable car shuttles up to the back of the canyon, dropped us off at the base of the railroad grade, and then we walked back what was the route of the railroad through Blythdale Canyon. Now take a look at that flyer, a few things it says there of interest. What's the price now? Does it say the price? By that time, it was up to $10 for non-members, $7 for members. But what I like below that, not so much like, I think it's kind of interesting. It says no strollers or pets. And from the day I started taking the walks, the posters always were very emphatic about no strollers or pets. And I, um, I asked why that was and said, well, strollers, people can't go up and down the stairs and they're just going to slow people up when they get to stairs and it creates a problem for the guys. And then, eh, whatever. Pets. I could see if the dog was not on a leash and giving you a hard time or, or causing trouble. But by now, I'm not sure. So you tell me, Deborah, are strollers and, and pets still discouraged or is it kind of like no big deal now? 
on the walks? I haven't led a, a tour for a couple of years, but I think often our terrain is not hospitable to strollers. Sometimes it is. This coming year, it will be. Um, and uh, pets, not everybody's comfortable with animals moving quickly around their feet <laughs> on uneven terrain. So, and is it still listed I'm, on the I'm sign? I'm sure they always show up. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to bring their pet. Yeah. Well, uh, there was one, there was a period there when we thought we were turning the young families off by saying, no strollers, as in, we don't want you and your rotten crying kids come along either. Well, we took away the no strollers and did make a big effort to reach out to younger families in we later, definitely want the kids later years. Here's a look at the guides in 2001. Uh, not sure who's watching this, but some of you old timers, not sure what an old time would be. I recognize some names of people you did know. And there's a few that are actually still leading walks. Besides myself up there, I know Dick Spotswood's name is, is there and Dick Spotswood still leads walks and we'll mention his name a couple of times as the as this presentation goes on the 2002 walk we covered the steps lanes and paths and that certainly would have been a difficult one for strollers this is a look at what barbara ford who for many years trained the walk guides worked on the guide book and was a board member she would frequently send out this invite and and more it's it's a note a heads up to the guides as to when the training sessions were coming up and if you wanted to be a train or if you still want to be a, a walk guide it's in if it's not encouraged it's almost mandatory that you take at least two what they call practice walks with a training guide and at least a couple others on your own in 2005 we started at the outdoor art club which is where most of the walks begin not all but most start at the outdoor art club walked over to Boyle Park, and that's what the outdoor art club certainly looks like on walk day. And that's Mrs. Shirley Larkins in the middle checking people in. She was a member from the very founding days, and I went to high school with her son, Jim Larkins. I see Barbara Ford in the background there. There's Barbara. You can see Barbara in a lot of shots in the background. So this is kind of like a where's Waldo? Where's Barbara in the shot you see in the background? 2006, we did start at Park School. The walk was around the area of Tamil Pines Park, which are the streets actually below, below Blythedale. And that year, I want to show one thing. There's a look at the people gathering. That's Melissa Kurtz, who for many years was on the board and was the membership chair. That's what I wanted to point out. You see that TV monitor there? They were showing a video loop of a video that somebody made that actually covered the walk. This person filmed the actual walk route, went to the houses, made a narration, did some, some title cards, and added some music. And those videotapes were shown at the walk just before. So if people perhaps needed some enticement or they were unsure about it, this showed what they were going to see. It also was a record of what you saw later. And these do exist in the library. There was about four or five years where this person who was me, made these videos and provided them to the Historical Society. We're going to see CJ a few times. CJ Carrillo, for many years, was the starter. And if you've taken walks any time in the past 15 years, you remember CJ as the big, loud guy who says, OK, Tim's group, you're up next. Everyone line up against the wall over there. Deborah's group, you're in the hole, so stand by. He has the, had the perfect voice. This is Lorraine Novak, who was the guide walk coordinator that year. The following year, 2009, also started at the Outdoor Art Club. The title was Horse and Buggy Days. It's still $9. And, oh, look, it looks like pets and strollers are okay this year. It may or may not still look this way. Oh, look there. There's this, um, the Mill Valley Historical Society emblem uh, logo i'm going to mention that in a couple of minutes but remember seeing it here in this picture here we are 2009 there's barbara there's barbara's back and there's cj getting ready to holler off the next group uh, the president at that time was john leonard that's john leonard there with the fishing cap and betsy cutler 
former mayor who was also on the board of directors at that time. 2010 was the Homestead Valley Walk. I think in my era, in the past 30 or so years, there probably have been at least two, maybe three walks in the Homestead Valley. And inevitably, those would have been encouraged by Chuck Crawford, not Chuck Crawford, Chuck Oldenburg, who I'll mention a few times as the evening goes by. Chuck was a resident of Homestead Valley and always loved showing off his backyard. And there was no better guide of Homestead Valley than Chuck. And he was always deeply involved in writing the, the copy of the book and leading groups. 2010, there's CJ again. And next to CJ is Vivian Broadway Firmage. She was the walk guide coordinator that year. Well, it's still $7 this year. And that fellow with the hat is Jim Stevenson, husband of Joan Murray, who's just to the right of Jim. You can't quite see him to the right. Joan was a, a president for a number of years, and I'll mention her again later as, as well. And this is Chuck forming his group in that little meadow area by the Homestead, Homestead Club and Pool. I want to point out this year, uh, a, this year was one of the years where I was the president, and I thought the Homestead Walk was going to be enormously popular, and it wasn't. 150 people showed up, which was way less than the average of 200, 300 on a good year, and I was disappointed. The following year, 2011, we had a walk around the downtown area called intellectual pursuits. It covered schools, churches, libraries. And I thought that was going to be a smashing hit. Turns out it was a dud. Even fewer than 150 people went. 125, I think, went to that. And so I was really, really let down, uh, disappointed, and almost embarrassed as the president that I hosted two walks that were so poorly attended. So 2012, which would have been my third year as the president, I was determined to set things on a better course. And I can't take credit for the actual idea of, of uh, this probably was Chuck uh, Oldenburg for that matter, who suggested people like going inside places, people like taking a walk where they can see something and where they can touch something. And so the idea came up that we would walk through the taverns and restaurants of downtown Mill Valley. And this year we did actually enter, you can see on the sign, maybe it's in the fine print's too small. We entered La Genestra and the El Paseo, and that was part of the reason it was a huge hit. I want to take a little bit of credit for actually really even pushing the numbers to a new level by insisting, if not demanding, that every board member who was on our group send a personal email to 25 of their friends not only inviting them, but twisting their arm, telling them, you've got to come take this walk. It's going to be fabulous. And so I think that push of having the members really reach out on a personal basis to their friends added to the numbers. I might point out that I myself contacted 50 people and 25 showed up. So I had 25 personal friends that were in my group. And there, there are a number of them. I might even, some of you guys might be watching. Are you out there, Bruce? There's Bruce's back. Bruce has been on my walk a number of times. And so you're not supposed to go out. You're not supposed to. It's uh, Traditionally, we try and keep the groups to a dozen or so. And if you get more than a dozen, it's hard to corral people and keep them in a group. And nevertheless, I went out with 25 because 25 of my friends showed up and they wanted to go in Tim's group. So, okay, let's go. So there are the numbers, a look out of the numbers from the year 2000 down to 2014. And on the right side of the screen, you can see where I wrote down the walk. 2012 downtown taverns and restaurants had over 350 walkers, which if you compare it to numbers on that screen, would have been the biggest numbers between 1999 and 2014. I'm pretty sure recent years have had more than that. Since yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, have they? Yeah, I haven't followed the record since I left the board, but those were numbers up through the time when I was I was involved with the board of directors. So the year after I left my presidency, <clears throat> Stella Perone took over, and we also had uh, some other new blood on the board. <clears throat> Pam Kean was a real go-getter. Pam Kean rewrote the book. Actually, she wrote this the guidebook that year. And it was the first year that the guides actually had photos of the stops. It was very well laid out. One of the best books. Wait, 
never had. Hey, excuse me, Tim. Yeah. Planes, Trains, and Indians, I believe, was Betty Girk and Chuck Ullenberg for this. Actually, one. you know what? Look, you can even look on the sign there. Let's see. Um, Pam was the guidebook editor. Yeah, route, editor. Design, route design, Betty Girk. Um, guide recruitment, Pam. Facebook editor, Pam. Guide trainees, Barbara, Betty. Uh, guidebook photos, Barbara Ford. So yeah, it, it was a true team effort that year. Yeah. I recall I, I guided on that one. You were a guide. Betty, oh. Betty wrote a lot of that. Oh, well, Betty's wonderful. I'm going to mention Betty's name, Betty Girk. Hang on to that name, pencil on your notes if you're taking notes, Betty Girk. Fabulous woman. And I will definitely mention Pe Betty again a little later on. And this is two years after, I think. Were you guiding by that time, Deborah? You, you, you said you I were. I started in 14. 20, 2015. You wrote were the, the guidebook in 17. So you waited until we had the good guidebooks before you joined. You said, I'm not going to be a guide leader until they straighten up these books. Oh, I will give a, a nice little shout out to Pam. Pam um, provided these hats one year uh, to those who led the, the walk. And boy, I wish I knew where the hat was because I love that hat. I think Bill Stock helped in that one, too. Who? Bill Stock, our president. Bill Stock was the president. Oh, I found my hat. Look at that. Yes, I do still have my hat. And I wear this every year when I lead the walks. Oh, there I am. In the background, you can see, Deborah, you're in the background. There's Dick Spotswood on the stairs. I see Phil Rhodes with his back to us. Let's talk for a minute or two about the review. So covered the walks, now the review. The yearly magazine, which comes out every May, it began as a quarterly in 1979, but quickly became a yearly, yearly tradition. And annually, either the president of the Historical Society or the editor will write a welcome or touch on some theme that the, the book will cover, not the book, the, the magazine. Let's look at a few of them in the 1980s to 1990s. And I think you'll see on the left is what the cover looked like, and on the right would have been one of the articles inside. And this article was written by Henri Boussy, I don't have a photo of Henri Boussy, but during the 80s, up until just before I joined, I, I never knew him as a board member, although I knew him as a teacher. He taught at TAM when I was a student at TAM. He was deeply involved with the Historical Society through the 80s. This is 1986. And you can see on the upper left corner, this says this copy was owned by Ron Olson. There's a name I'll mention in just a minute, Ron Olson. 1988, the head article was written by Fred Sandrock, who wrote about Mount Tam. 1990, again, Henri Boussy wrote the feature article. 1994, again, Henri Boussy wrote about the fire department. This was the year I actually took my first walk. This is one of the early reviews I remember coming in my mailbox. Oh, and there in the middle, that's Treehaven. I was talking about the, the home that we covered and a walk, I guess this was 1997, Helen Dreyfus Thompson grew up in that house and then many years later was the first president of the Mavada Historical Society. In 2008, the theme was Tam High School because they were celebrating their centennial. The article written there by some guy named Tim. 2014, we touched on the Locust District and we're getting towards the Current Times, 2018, the Dipsy was on the cover with an article by Fred Runner on the inside. Fred Runner, another name I'll touch on a little bit later in the talk. And here's the most recent guy uh, review from last year, 2022. And I do want to point out three editors in particular who have been long-term editors. The first editor who did it for four years or more was Jeremy Gordon between 83 and 86. And then this fellow, who I never knew, he was there briefly before I got deeply involved. Mark Brewery, for 14 years, was the editor of the review. He also served a couple of years as the president of the Historical Society. Joan Murray did it three years and was also president for a few years. My neighbor, Wendy Zutlin, 
who lived in Tam Valley, just two blocks away from me, did it for three years. And my good friend, Michael Lippman, Lippy, if any of you live in Homestead Valley, everyone knows Lippy. He only did it one year, but he was such a great guy. I loved Lippy and he did a wonderful review. So I'm giving Lippy an extra shout out, even though he only did it one year. Abby Wasserman currently still doing the review. Is she going to do it again this year, Deborah? Yes. Abby, on. so you can change that to 11 plus years for Abby Wasserman as our review editor. These are three things that are kind of all interrelated membership board of directors and the annual meeting and dinner, which I so miss. I'm so looking forward to the dinner. I mean, that the walk and the annual dinner were the two things that kind of were on the opposite ends of the year, two of the big events that I annually looked forward annually looked forward to. I looked forward to the Dipsy, Christmas, and those two events of the Historical Society. And I'm so looking forward to the day when those return. As the bylaws state, the board of directors needs to have a minimum of 10 and no more than 18. And currently, they have 10. And I'm told by our current president, Nancy Emerson, that there are approximately 450 members. Again, that was a look at the first board of directors, 1978. And let me show you a close-up of these folks. This was the board of directors the year that I joined as a member. And the president was being handed, the baton was being handed from Mark Brewery to Joseph Gavin. Mark is the, on the lower right with the tie. And if you look two to his left, it goes Mark, then a man with a beard who's, who's um, Jonathan Jacobs. And then there's Josette, who would become the president the year I, I first joined. And I remember seeing these people introduced at the annual dinner and I thought they were royalty. Whoa, look at that. The board of directors of the Mill Valley Historical Society. She is the president. Wow, she must really be in board. And to the left of Josette is Ron Olson. And is it time for me to talk about Ron Olson? It is time for me to talk about Ron Olson. Ron Olson was a special, special man. Passed away far too young. He was the president when I first made uh, the connection to going from member to active member in terms of doing things and leading walks. And he was so encouraging and had just always had a, a positive veneer about him that was, was so missed. He passed away the actual year I joined. He was on the board of directors with me for, for one year. And this is the first year, the first meeting where I was, I don't want to say welcomed, but approved as a board member. In the very middle, it says who the directors were. Below President Stephanie Wickham Witt. Then there's Vice President Joan Murray, Treasurer Bill Devlin, Secretary Grace Larry. Oh, Grace was a wonderful woman. And also she passed away too young. She passed away just a year after after Ron. I remember the very first year I was the young kid on the block and two senior citizens passed away. And it was it was quite sad to lose Ron almost immediately. And then Grace within a year after that. Well, this was the, the first year I was on the board of directors, fall of 2000, and I want to jump to the next slide of what a letter was sent out to me a few days after. It said, your nomination to serve on the MBHS was unanimously approved at the 23rd annual dinner. And I always kind of wondered, are they ever not unanimously approved? Are there ever people that say, ah, I protest Tim, but nevertheless, the motion passes anyway. And then how are you going to feel if there are two or three people that... Didn't want you on, but yet there you are. It's almost always unanimous. It's always unanimous. That same spring in the news flyer, there was a little welcome to the new board member. What kind of catches my eye at the very, very bottom line, it says he, Tim and his wife and their two daughters aged six and three. My daughters aged six and three are now aged 29 and 26. So it was a while ago. So this was the very first year I was on the board of directors, 2001. And this was the last year I was on the board of directors, 14 years later. And there's me up right behind Chuck Oldenburg. And this year, Stella was the president. The distinguishing looking fellow with the suit, that's Bill Stock. He became the president the year after. And behind Bill is Stella Perone, who was the president uh, who took over after me. And just to the right of Stella is Betty Girk. 
These are names of people who have served in the presidency mode for three years or more. Norman Ortman, three. Paul DeFremery, three. Ron Olson, four. Then John Murray, three. John Leonard, who preceded me, was in that spot for five years. And he set the record until a fellow wasn't directly after me. But shortly after I did my four years, it went Stella. And then Erna went Stella, then Bill Stock for a couple, and then Eric Macris took over in 2017 and did it for six years. And only this past fall did Eric step down. And now your current president is Nancy Emerson. When you first joined the Historical Society in the 1970s, this was a, the application, and it cost $5 a year to join, $1 if you were under 19, or only a dollar if you were 60 or over. By the 1980s, it was up to $7.50 a year. And this was December 1992, my welcome letter from Janet Upman membership. And I'm wondering if membership still sends out these personal letters to welcome people in. The annual membership meeting dinner, as I did touch on every October, the very first one I went to was this one here, 1992. Three things I remember about that that I have to mention. I sat at the same table with Ron Olson, who was a board member at that time, and his wife. And I remember how tickled that Ron Olson was that there was someone under 40 years old at the meeting. At that time, I was 33 and my wife was 29. So we were just kids. There was not a single person in the entire room under 40, and most were not even under 50. And they thought it was just so wonderful that somebody so young was attending the meeting. So sitting next to Ron was, was memorable. And the speaker that night was Colonel Milton Hasley, a military historian, talking about the impact of the history of the military in the Headlands and the San Francisco Bay. And to this day, I have never seen a talk that was as wonderful as his. He was such a fantastic speaker. And he did it with minimal, minimal um, props and aids, as I recall. I don't even think he was a PowerPoint, but he was just such an engaging speaker. This is what the, the invite looks looked like just seven years ago. And it, I believe it's still a potluck, which is kind of a charming thing. Everyone's supposed to bring a little something to share and you have at the dinner table. There's what the tables look like. All these wonderful salads and casseroles. And there's Fred Runner on one of the tables. This is uh, 2009, I believe. And there's President John Leonard giving the welcoming speech. Each year at the annual meeting, the treasurer, this is Bill Devlin, read off the financial report. The speaker this evening was Richard Torney, who was talking about the earthquake and its effect in San Francisco. Richard's given numerous talks, as has Fred Runner and Dick Spotswood, on trains. Richard is a, a train guy, but this time was talking about the earthquake. On the lower right, you can see Betty Kirk there setting up her slideshow for a 20 11 presentation she was given at the annual dinner in 2015. The new guy, the new kids on the block in the lower left is Eric Macris. He was a new member in 2015. And the upper right, look, there's Nancy Emerson, another new kid on the block. And both of those, one is the current president and one is the preceding president of the Historical Society. At the 2018 dinner, not so long ago, there's me with my wife right next to Nancy and Steve. And there's so many connections that we all have in town, but Nancy and Steve and I go way back in terms of our kids were together at Tam Valley School. And so we were co-parents for a number of years at Tam Valley School. I well, was speaking at Tam Valley School, another kid, that big tall guy, that's uh, Brennan Wirtz. He was a friend of my daughter's from Tam Valley School and his parents, Raul and Wendy, longtime members, always attended the walks and the dinners. And I guess they dragged their, at that time, probably a 20, 21 year old son to the dinner. So he won the award that evening to being the youngest in the crowd. The first Wednesday speakers, if I were to name the top three things of the historical society for in Tim's point of view, it's the walk, it's the annual dinner, and it's the first Wednesday speakers, which we are here today. And this is what the website looks like. If you're going to take a peek at what the website is. The initial invitations came out via mail. A little flyer looked like this. This was Richard giving a 2006 talk. 2007, this is what it looked like when we got in the mail our 
promotion for Betty's talk about Chief Marin. Jumping up to 2015, there's Deborah. You've seen, you saw Deborah earlier on, and she'll pop in a little bit later. Deborah took over the first Wednesday, the first Wednesday program in 2015, and has taken it to new levels of success. So, congratulations and thank you, Deborah. There's a quick look. I'm not going to spend time mentioning, but these were some of the big popular speakers when I was either on the board or spent five years being the the chairman chairperson of the of the first Wednesdays as well. Let me just look into that. Dan Sebi, the fifth one down, was a classmate of mine, gave a great talk on military history. Joel Bartlett, KGO meteorologist, came one day. John Sias, if any of you know John Sias, he's passed, he passed away a number of years ago. Uh, he was the CEO of the Chronicle for a number of years and the ABC Network president, also graduate of Tamil Pice High School. He spoke one year at our annual dinner. To more modern times, Fred Runner talks many talks frequently about railroads, and we'll touch on Fred in just a minute. This was a big, 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 big smashing hit just a couple of weeks before the world shut down for COVID in March 2020. Deborah hosted this evening with Huey Johnson, Doug Ferguson, Bob Pratchell, and Martin Griffin. Marin Cello, Marin Cello revisited. And there are the four guest speakers there that evening. While we've been in the in the Zoom mode, Deborah did do a. Did you do an interview, Deborah, or did John just give Q and a Q and A with uh, John Goddard and prune music and a lot of a lot of our talks are Q and A. John Goddard and uh, it's hard to believe, but for anyone that moved to Mill Valley after two thousand and seven, you have no concept of what the Village Music Store was. Hard to believe it was two thousand and seven. 16 years ago when the village music was closed. And boom, there we are today. Can't get much more present than that. Let's touch on some of the other special projects that the Historical Society has done or sponsored over the years. In 2008, our logo was created. Before 2008, we had no logo or emblem. Went through a big process and took, I want to say it took the better part of a year to try and decide Voting on this artwork, this artwork, this artwork, and finally this one here with the, the old mill with the circle of the Mill Valley Historical Society emblem. One of the was the winner of the, the options. And there's what it looks like on one of the big logos. Right now, both of the logos are hanging in Mill Valley for a long period of time. One, we took around to events like I showed earlier at the Outdoor Art Club, and the other was hanging here's the crossing of Tamil Pius High School and Safeway. And right in the middle there, you can see where we are mounted in that kiosk that is run by the Rotary Club. In 2014, our banner was created. You probably thought, oh, that's been around forever because every year you drive by Boyle Park in May, you'll see us promoting the, the walk. But previously to 2014, we had no banner. It also gets taken to other parts around town because last I checked, we get one week per year to hang it up in in that spot above, um, above Lifedale. In 2012, Dick Spotswood organized a team to recreate these logos, these emblems, these medallions that are currently on the book depot. I frequently call it the the train depot, the bus depot, the book depot. It's It's been all three of those. But if you were looking at this building previously to 2012, those would not have been there. And Dick organized a, a group that was a combination of the Rotary Club, the Historical Society, and City Hall, basically for getting their okay. And also City Hall owns, the City of Valley owns the building. And you can see back there, on the lower right of the building, if you're looking from the coffee shop, you can see a plaque. Next time you're downtown, you can read the details of the plaque and who got the credit for making it happen with a little story about what the railroad building was at the time. <clears throat> this is a special project that only five years ago came to fruition, the Trans Market Trail Map. What was the Trans Market? I'll show you in just a minute. But let's look at what is at the corner of Old Mill and Throckmorton right now. Condominiums, very nice condominiums across the street from the park. What was there in 2010? What was there in 2010 was the construction of 
those condominiums going up. Previously to 2010, that's what stood there for many years. So if you were around before 2004, you remember that old abandoned building that was transfixed at shop in the 90s and 80s, but in the 70s, 60s, and 50s, it was a market run by a fellow named Trans. And he went out of business, made it a fix-it shop. Eventually, the, when he passed away, the family sold it off and they demolished it to build these. But the story behind that shop is that map you'll see on the lower right. That map was cut, was painted over the top of that building sometime in the early 50s, covered in the 60s by wood, thinking that the hikers didn't know, would no longer utilize it. And it was covered for many years until they demolished, we're going to demolish the building in 2004. And it was revealed, well, look at this, an old trail map, this old cool trail map. And to make a long story short, the Historical Society asked if they could take it down before they demolished the building. And thanks to uh, Joan Murray's wife, Jim Stevenson, and C.J. Carrillo, they spent hours tearing that thing down, took it to C.J.'s garage, stored it there for a number of years. Later, it went to another fella, Guy Palmer, who stored it in his garage until this historical society finally, again, long story, but uh, big thanks to Helen Russell for finding the location, Deborah for assisting, and Jill Benton, a member of the historical society who really made this her pet project to see this happen. And finally, many years, in 2018, here's the location where it now resides, which is next to the Urban Remedy store, which faces the Gravity Tavern which used to be Jenny Lowe's or the Balboa restaurant. And it was given a grand opening in October, 2018. And there's Guy Palmer on the top who mounted this. And this is a video clip. So let's see if this actually plays like it. That was 2011, and there's Helen Russell in the foreground, owner of the Equator, who helped get permission to have it built, mounted on this wall. And then behind her, Jill, with the microphone, was the, the chair of the Let's Get This Map Mounted Committee from the Historical Society. Quickly touch on some other traditions and projects of the Historical Society. They had bookmarks from the 1990s to the 20. Tens. There was a scavenger hunt that was organized a few years. Uh, now, okay, now I've got to mention this with a with a little uh, extra time. The vignettes. Chuck Oldenburg, who I touched on a, a short while ago, longtime resident of Homestead Valley, passed away just last week. Chuck was so dear to many of us in the historical society because he was such an impact first on Homestead Valley and then later with the historical society with his hours he spent on walks and with the board. And he was the, the brainchild of the Mill Valley Historical Society vignettes. They begin as vignettes about Homestead Valley, and eventually his interest and time expanded to the Mill Valley, history of Mill Valley. So these come out weekly, bi-weekly, occasionally. To those of you that are members, you'll get these vignettes that Chuck was the writer of. So a thanks to truck, Chuck and I'm going to touch on Chuck one more time in just a, a few minutes down the line. Calendars were, were created in the 80s. Three years they were sold by the Historical Society. Three calendars of the 80s. Barry Spitz wrote The Bible in 1996 about Mill Valley. It was not sponsored by the Historical Society. Yet at the same time, we, we refer to it all the time as though, as though it were our own. The current Mill Valley Historical Society has a bookstore. And if you go to the, the website, You'll see these books offered for sale at the at the bookstore, and not entirely Mill Valley related. But I have to mention again, our own Betty Girk wrote the book about Chief Marin and the Miwoks in 2007. Just one year after she wrote the book, she also helped chair a group that placed a plaque down on Locust. It's on Locust, just a block up from, from Sycamore. This plaque, which is dedicated to Chief Marin and the Miwoks, 
which is more or less where they're, <laughs> for lack of a better word, where downtown, the downtown Miwok village was. And this was a group of third graders that were there. And the vice president at the time said a few words at the opening or placing of the plaque. Some special projects are work in progress. Engine number nine, I'm going to go a little bit quicker because our time is ticking. Engine number nine is a special project that is supervised by Fred Runner. Here's Fred up in Humboldt County looking at engine number nine, which at one time was the train that hauled people up Mount Tamalpais. It was purchased for $54,000 a couple of years ago with a fair amount of funds provided by the Mill Valley Historical Society. And it's the hope of one day to get that train somewhere placed around Mill Valley. And there is a, a link on the website you can follow more directly of how the progress is going. Now there's Fred on the left, president of the time for the Historical Society, Eric Macris, Arlene Halligan, Bruce Lowenthal, and, and Joe Breeze. Just three months ago, there was a dedication for Chuck and Betty. And Chuck was still alive. And this was a wonderful thing because Chuck Oldenburg and Betty Girk, two longtime members and two of the most influential people on the Historical Society were given their due by having a plaque. Well, there's Deborah and the president, Eric Macris. There's the plaque in honor of Chuck and Betty that's placed on that rock over behind, I shouldn't say behind, southeast of the library. Now there's Chuck giving a few words of thanks, as was Betty. And it's so special that we were able to do this because, as I mentioned, Chuck passed away last week. But this special honor attended by, you can go back and see, there were dozens of members of his family, as well as people from the Historical Society that were there to honor Chuck and Betty. Very special day. So hats off to the Historical Society for putting that together. I'm going to go through these real fast. Uh, interpretive Science is a project began in 2019, and the first one was placed at Boyle Park. And now there's also one that is the Hub Theater on the left. To the right would have been the location of the Tamil Pius Land and Water Company offices. I want to point out the historical Society webpage. The first one was created in 2004 by Alan Nayer. It's been redone quite a few times since then. This is what the opening page looks like. And if you go to that opening page and you hit the play button, there's a video. Let's see if I can play that video. About a 20 second video, but this is what you know. And we need to give credit to President Eric Macris. There's Eric Macris, Jimmy Clay, and local filmmaker Gary Yost get the credit for putting that together. And Tom Killian's artwork. And Tom Killian's artwork is mentioned there also. Uh, there have been three librarians at Mill Valley since the opening of the History Room, which is kind of impressive. That many years, there have only been three librarians, and there they are, Thelma Percy and Montgomery, and the current librarian, Angie Brenner, 2005 till present and want to give a special shout out and thanks to Angie for always being so cooperative and supportive of the historical society and the history room. The history room itself has had at least five people that quote unquote run it currently. Natalie Snoyman. Is that right? Am I saying it right? Yes. And Deborah Natalie Snoyman has been there since 2020 and she, her title is supervising archivist. Previous years, they've gone by super archivist, archivist, or his reference librarian. And you can see the names of other folks who have been doing it as well. Oral histories, if you want to read more about the oral histories, it began in 1968. They began in 1968 with Joe and Ruth Wilson founding the project. And Lucretia Little continued it, as I mentioned, for a number of years before she passed away. And uh, Deborah and Natalie and Abby, there's their picture there. They are key members of making it happen and continue the oral history tradition. 
Three other Hall of Famers I want to mention. This is just Tim's personal list. Victoria Talkin has never yet been. She told me once, sooner or later, she's going to be on the board of directors with the Historical Society. But I give her a quick shout out because she was the big mover and shaker. It was part of saving the, the steps and lanes and paths movement about 15, not quite 20, 15 years ago when a lot of the stairs were falling apart. And she led a, a group of people to convince the city they needed to reinvest and maintain these steps. Jan, Matt Matthews is currently a board member. He and his wife, Jan, saved the lumber yard. And my favorite person in the whole wide world, Gene Stocking, who I don't think I'm touching on until right now. Gene Stocking was a board member when I was there, former president. She's the granddaughter of Jacob Gardner, and she is a Mill Valley legend. So you're going to need to know about Jacob Gardner by reading somewhere else who he was, the impact he had on Mill Valley, and he was Gene Stocking's grandfather. And we are going to ride off into the sunset by playing this video clip from an 1898 movie by Thomas and Edison's Edison and his crew. That's a Mount Tam train coming out of the Mount Tam Tavern at the top of Mount Tam Pius. One of the very first movies made, period. And look at the top of Mount Tam. And that's what I call riding off into the sunset. <laughs> Deborah. Fini. That's it. Nice. There's no crowd. Someone out there, my mother, someone out there, my mother's clapping, but <laughs> I can't hear her. There you go. Thank you so much, Tim. That's a lot of information to get. I want to add that our historical signage is continuing to go on. As you could, if you walk around town, you'll see that we continue to create new signage to capture history for those to see and that we have other plaques besides the Chief Marin plaque. There's the John Reed original uh, homestead site plaque and there's a Cypress Knowles plaque. And we as a, as a historical society try to continue to enhance and uh, distribute information and plaques in everything, any little way we can. Um, also, I wanted to add that the review magazines are really something special. You showed some of the covers, but I mean, these are beautifully done magazines, oh, high quality paper, high quality printing. And they're often uh, not just for our membership, but they're sold in bookstores and uh, in um, they're in libraries. So I can't uh, brag enough about the review magazines. I'm looking forward to this year's too. Uh, so is there anything we've forgotten to talk about today, Tim? Oh my goodness. That was just touching on everything. And I flew through so much of it. I, 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 one thing I didn't mention that I, is, was special to a number of people, and depending on what your interests are, some people ha have an interest in this, some people have an interest in that. Before I was the president, there was a big interest in, what's the word for it, um, preservation, for archiving and logging houses that needed to be preserved. And it's something that kind of has come and gone, but that was a, something I didn't touch on that was a big part of the Historical Society in the uh, 1990s, architectural preservation. Yeah, right. Exactly. There was that too. Uh, you know, the, I think... Um, the historical society presence is one of those presence that uh, cares. We're a caring society. We genuinely care about our community and um, paying attention to what's going on. And if, if there's work to be done or houses to be looked at, the historical society is often an agency that uh, the city will come to as will architects. So we're available in that regard. Um, there are a lot, of, a few questions here, Tim. Are you ready to take some questions? Sure. Okay. There's comments. I'm going to read questions and comments. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, here's one. Uh, let's see. Here, here's some people I know. It says, hi, Deborah and Tim. It's Kelly and Phil. Fun Hi. presentation. Is the history guide still produced each year? We want to get on. Tim's Walk Memorial Day. Well, <laughs> this, we are going to have a history walk this year. And it's going to be unlike any other history walk we've had so far. It's in the formation. And there will be a guidebook. Yes, there will. And uh, so stay tuned for more about that. 
Anything to add, Tim? About the walk? Well, I'll be leading my group and I'll probably send a personal email to my 50 friends again and say, come take Tim's walk and we'll see how many show up. <laughs> okay. And Kelly asks, how can we get the review? If you're a member, you'll get the review. If you aren't a member, you can buy the review through the bookstore, I suspect, this year. And usually the Depot bookstore keeps reviews. And also, also in, I believe, uh, various other local bookstores as well. And here's Bruce says, I want Dibs to be on Tim's History Walk. Okay, we hear you loud and clear. Remember is that, that Bruce S? Bruce S has been taking my walk for years. He's a high school friend of mine. And uh, Rita Abrams. Uh, she says, very grateful to you both in this wonderful organization. And Rita was the first Wednesday guest speaker I wanted to point out one time. She sang the Mavali song. What better guest can you have at a first Wednesday? I think it was actually one of the annual dinners she, she sang and performed. She'd have an encore on that. <laughs> uh, here's uh, from Maureen. It says, thanks and congratulations to Abby Wasserman for her great work on the Mill Valley Historical Society Review. It includes well-researched articles and wonderful photos. And that and so much more. We owe Abby Wasserman a great debt. She's Absolutely. a fantastic Absolutely. editor. There's, you know, there is what makes a historical society great is so many different kinds of people and particularly a few. Abby's one of them, in my opinion. And uh, here's another one, uh, Stella. Hey, Stella. And to everyone, Tim, nice job. Thoroughly enjoyed. Thanks. I'm missing you, Stella. Not a girl, Stella. Uh, here's one, Marilyn, to everyone. Here's a comment. My great-grandfather was an editor for the San Francisco Chronicle during the earthquake, and the fireman told him he had to leave his office and get out of town. So he grabbed an old-fashioned bike and rode to Santa Clara, where his family was staying. My youngest brother carved and painted a wooden logo type sign in the late 60s, and it was placed outside the Chamber of Commerce, where my mother was secretary manager. We don't know whatever happened to it. It was rather big. His name was Trans. Sold lots of candy to us old mill school kids. Ah, that's the All had candy on a wall mm -hmm. behind the cash register. You are bringing back lots of memories. What happened to that sign? Which sign? That it says here, carved and painted a wooden oh. logo type sign. Mm -hmm. I wonder mm -hmm. if it's in the history room. <laughs> hmm. Okay, uh, Abby, here she is. Thanks, Tim, for great talks. So grateful to have you still involved in the Mill Valley Historical Society. And here, um, here, someone said, Charlotte says, I see my father, William Mills, Millis, in one of the old photos. Let me get to the question. Oh, I get a thanks for the first Wednesday programs. You're welcome. Uh, here's from Susan Agile. Whoops, just move. Sorry, when someone adds a new comment, I can, things go out of order. Hang on one second. Here's from Susan. Thank you, Mill Valley Historical Society. My great grandfather, John Finn Sr., grandfather and father, I was born in Mill Valley in 1952. I love that you have saved so much history. Here's from Maureen. I always liked Tim Amex since he purchased a Honda CRV after admiring mine. Nice job tonight. Oh, yeah. Maureen and I go back to the days we have both had blue 1997 CRVs. This is from Wendy. Fond memories of long ago potlucks where you had to bring your own silverware. Mill Valley was paying attention to reusable foodware long before the latest ordinance we just passed recently. I always felt it was history of the potluck dish. Fun to think back to the many years of great historical society dinners. Remember the first dinner we had after COVID, uh, it was online and I provided pictures of food. <laughs> I don't remember Here's that. Here's Rita. Um, if any of you remember the Mill Valley variety shows, you will recall the comedy sketches performed by the Mill Valley Hysterical Society. Now that I'd like to see. Good pun. 
Okay, here we have some questions. Oh, this is a comment in the question section. This is from Tamara. We went to high school and more together. Thank you for all that you do. Tammy, that's for you, Tim. And Maureen asks, when will the Mill Valley Historical Society annual dinner be scheduled? I do not know the answer to that question because I am no longer on the board, but it's usually in October and it usually starts scheduling from you know, a couple months before. So I suspect, Maureen, if you are a Mill Valley Historical Society member, you will be hearing about that. And if you're not, you should join. So you will. Um, and again, another question, how do we get the historical review? As I said, membership, membership, membership. That gives you the key to the kingdom. Um, On that note, membership, membership. Um, I see a note there from Melissa and Larry Kurtz. Melissa, former membership. So get your check in. Melissa's right there thinking about them. <laughs> Any other questions, anybody? Again, on a personal note, I want to just say how sorry we are to say goodbye to Chuck Oldenburg. He was my first leading uh, teaching guide for the historical uh, walk for the Memorial Weekend walk. And because of him, I joined the Historical Society. He has just been such a mentor and a guide and uh, an example to all of us. So we are very, very sorry that he is gone. And we are very, very grateful that we had him for so very long. Now, before we close, Tim, I want to say thank you for bringing up this idea. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to see some of that old material and obviously you're a bit of a pack rack so thank you for that i i am indeed you can see behind me are some of the posters from that i keep i have boxes of my old stuff i'm kind of like ron olson many years later keeping everything i could possibly keep from my years either on the board or as a member I also want to thank you for all that you give to the Historical Society. You've helped us with your video skills in the past. You've been involved in so many different levels. And so thank you for that. You are welcome. And uh, now let's go on to the close. For those of you who have enjoyed our weekly email history vignettes composed by our dear departed Chuck Oldenburg, you'll be pleased to hear that those vignettes have been bound into a new book called Mill Valley History Vignettes, Volume 2. It's a compilation of 152 of Chuck's most recent vignettes. And volume two makes a wonderful companion to Chuck's original book, Mill, Mill Valley History Vignettes, which continues to be available in our Mill Valley Historical Society bookstore. But isn't it cool we have a bookstore? You know, I was just thinking about that, how wonderful we have a bookstore. And in some cases we publish a book and so it is with adventures of Two Coast Miwok Children, written by my dear friend and fellow board member, Betty Gerp, also recipient of a Lifetime um, uh, Achievement Award. And she's she and Chuck together are in that uh, beautiful uh, tree planting ceremony. This beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily lives of a real boy and girl who lived in neighboring villages on San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in the story is named Huik Musa, but he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin County's namesake. It's a precious and truly beautiful book and a great gift for children and adults. Well, that about wraps it up. Special thanks again to Tim for the wonderful presentation and to Franklin for his technical support and to all of you in the audience for your interest and patronage. Please join us next month, that's May 3rd, for our first live event since March of 2020 and our first live outdoor event ever at the Mill Valley Public Library Amphitheater. It will start a little earlier at 6 p.m. and we're going to talk about a place that got a hold on me, Mill Valley. A little place where life feels very fun and free. Mill Valley. Yes, indeed. 
It's an encore performance by Rita Abrams, and the program title is Mill Valley, The Song Heard Round the World. So hope to see you there. It'll be wonderful to have an audience again and to be, be together again. Be careful now, there may be singing in this, this particular talk, and I'm excited about it. Till then, be well and good night. <laughs>